Have you ever had a gun to your head? I have, and I wouldn't recommend it, but I will say this. It's actually a mildly psychedelic experience. In the moments after I saw my potential killer pull his gun from his waistband, chamber around, and then point the barrel squarely at my face, it was like I could smell air and taste the roof of my mouth. When he spoke, I had never listened to anyone so intently in my entire life, and when he asked me a question, it took every ounce of physical and mental strength I had to force out a lie. It was like that golden lasso Wonder Woman uses. One look at the gun, and I almost had an aneurysm trying not to tell the truth. But now that I've sufficiently teased you with sort of a sneak preview of this oncoming story, I guess a lot of you are probably asking, well how did you end up getting a gun pointed at your face? Well now I gotta tell you. I'm working the night shift at a crappy motel just outside of Whittington, Illinois. My two best friends managed to get tickets to Lollapalooza the previous year, whereas my broke self couldn't even afford a bus ticket. They had the best weekend of their lives, and I spent the weekend handing out resumes and vowing never to be left out like that again. The long and very tiring job search ended in me getting a night position at the motel, and then for about seven and a half months, I worked 9pm to 6am, five nights a week. It definitely wasn't the worst job I'd ever had, but it had two modes, total boredom, or the weirdest, wildest stuff you've ever seen happen in your life. I once saw a guy walk in the middle of the parking lot, completely naked, in the middle of the night, taking a pee right there as if though it was nothing. It took me a good minute to realize that he was sleepwalking, or should that be sleep peeing, that he wasn't completely out of his gourd. And then another time I saw these two drag queens squaring off about to fight each other. One of them puts his oversized purse down and then hurls himself at his companion while rolling around on the ground. A tiny dog jumped out of the purse and then ran off into the darkness, yapping the whole way. The two drag queens immediately forgot what they were fighting about, got up and then ran off after their dog shouting, Pickle, pickle, come back. And I never saw either of them again. Or maybe I did, I just didn't recognize them. Anyways, like I said, this was maybe 10% of the job, and the other 90% was comprised of incalculable tedium, the likes of which mankind has never experienced. During the fall and winter of 2006 to 2007, I read more books in those six months than I had during the entirety of my school education. And I was doing just that, reading a book on the night that I got that gun pointed at my head. It was coming up on 30 minutes after midnight when I heard the door of this check-in area open. I put my book down, looked up, and there's this dude walking up to my desk. Totally normal dad-looking dude, but he has this really weird-looking smile on his face. It looked like he was forcing it, so instead of coming across as friendly, he came across as super menacing, and the fact that he was breathing heavy didn't really exactly help his case either. He comes up straight to the desk and with that weird sharp grin on his face, asks me if a couple checked in just a few hours ago. He then describes the couple in quite vivid detail actually and then loses his smile completely for a second when I tell him that I can't divulge any information like that. That wasn't exactly true, I wasn't barred from giving out info, I just didn't like the vibe that I was getting off the guy so I told him no. He then starts telling me how it's an emergency that he has to talk to these people and that he can't get them on their phones for some reason so he's driven all the way here, blah blah blah. Again, I gave him some official sounding answer along with the most genuine apology that I could muster because the thing is, he was right. A couple had checked in just a few hours before, one matching the exact description he'd given me too. I hadn't done the math yet but I was still concerned enough to refrain from telling him the truth. He then asked me one more time, saying, I'm asking you nicely. Then when I refused again, that's when he pulled the gun. So I knew for a fact that if I told him what room the couple were in, he was going to walk over there, get inside somehow, and shoot them both dead. I had to lie to him, but if I gave him the number of an occupied room and he goes and starts shooting through the window indiscriminately, then I'm going to have their blood on my hands for the rest of my freaking life. So while the guy is literally counting down from 10, telling me how he's going to blow my mother effing brains out if I don't tell which motel room his filthy floozy of a wife is in, 
I gotta try and remember which rooms are empty. And this is all while filled with this near overwhelming urge to just tell him the truth so I can save my butt as well as the butts of anyone not involved in what I'm assuming is an explosive case of marital cheating, obviously. I'm racking my brains, second guessing myself, thinking I'm 99% sure 17 is empty but if I'm wrong, I'm dead. And then right when he gets to 3, on his slow executioner countdown style, I could just commit to it. I tell him, room 17, that's where they are, just please don't kill me. His smile returned, genuine this time, and he tells me, attaboy. The second he walks out of the check-in area, I run into the back office, lock the door, and call the cops. We had some little monitors in there while watching the parking lot and the doors to the rooms, so while I'm on the 911 call, I'm able to watch what the guy's doing. He walks right up to room 17, then starts hammering on the door and shouting. I'm praying the light doesn't come on because the first person who opens the door is probably going to get a bullet. But then it doesn't come on, and no one opens the door because I somehow managed to actually pick out an empty room and thus buying us all some time. At least I thought it might buy us all some time when, in reality, it only bought us all about 10 seconds. When the man with the sharp smile realizes no one is in room 17, the guy starts walking back and forth in the parking lot, and I can't hear exactly what he's saying, but all the way from the office I can hear him ranting and raving, and then, boom. He fires off a shot in the air, maybe to make a point or something, but that's what woke up my boss. He was the heaviest sleeper I ever knew in my whole life. Remember that drag queen dog fight that I was telling you about? He slept through that whole thing. I thought he'd be out in his underwear, white hair all stood up shouting something at them, but he didn't. He slept right through it. Yet when I heard that gunshot, the response was movement in the room upstairs, the room where my boss slept. I heard his footsteps moving too, moving away from his bed towards the door which overlooked the parking lot, and I was almost 100% certain that he was about to get himself shot. It also just happened that the guy had started walking back towards the check-in area which naturally scared the ever-living crap out of me because I assumed that he wanted to come back and punish me for lying to him. I'm locked in the office and it's only a thin door, there's just one tiny room I can use to crawl out of if I climb up high enough, and that's what I was doing when I heard the second big bang. Only that time, the bang was followed by a different kind of screaming coming from the parking lot. It was definitely the same dude who put his gun to my head, but he's not screaming in anger. He's screaming in what sounded like a lot of agony. My boss had walked out from his room upstairs, saw the guy walking towards the office with that gun in his hand, and pulled the trigger first. Only the thing was, his gun wasn't a pistol. It was a double-barreled 12-gauge, and the shells were filled with rock salt. The guy was still screaming in pain when the cops put him in cuffs, and... By the time the EMT showed up, he was a bloody, whimpering mess when they put him in the back of the ambulance. My boss had shot him in the face, almost at point-blank range, sending dozens of sharp rock-salt crystals tearing into his face. I think at a distance, the shots wouldn't have done anything except scare him, but up close, let's just say that I'd be surprised if he regained all of his eyesight after the damage that had been done. Sometime after, I asked my boss, why rock salt? And in the seconds after I asked, I realized what a dumb question it was. Won't kill a man, he said, but it hurts. And boy was he right. The way the guy screamed, the way the agony just broke him down slowly until he was nothing but just a mess. I don't ever want to feel pain like that for as long as I live. I ended up working at that motel for a few more months and then I found a job that didn't make me feel like a vampire. It was nice to reclaim the daylight, but I'll tell you something. I never felt as safe as I did working at that check-in desk, not with chubby Clint Eastwood sleeping in the room above me. On the day I escaped my violent ex-boyfriend, I ended up at a little motel in Cooper County, Missouri. I had been working up for quite a while making preparations, squirreling away a few bucks here and a few bucks there. 
Then one day, when I had enough money, and I knew that I was going to be out the entire day, I packed my stuff, got a cab to a car rental place, and then got the hell out of St. Louis. It had gotten past the point where I thought that he might one day kill me, to the point that I believed that he was gearing up to actually do it. I said all kinds of stuff, but I knew that deep down he hated me. Almost everything he did, even some of the things that seemed nice on the surface, were all just ways of putting me down and keeping me down. But at the same time, I knew that he'd never let me leave, not fully. He was jealous. Almost everything he did, even some of the things that seemed nice on the surface, were all just ways of putting me down and keeping me down. But at the same time, I knew that he'd never let me leave, not fully. He was jealous, about every little thing too. He was without a doubt the most bitter man I've ever had the displeasure of knowing, and after bashing my head into the refrigerator one day, I decided enough was enough. I called my mom, begged her to let me stay at her place, and despite years of me doing everything I could to alienate her, she said yes. And after that, all I had to do was wait for the day and then, adios, I was on the road. I cried almost the whole drive and after being unable to sleep for the whole of the previous night, I think I was on the road for a total of three to four hours before I started to feel too effed up to drive. The last thing I wanted to do was total the car and end up in the hospital instead of my mom's, because if I did, it was my ex that would hear about it first. I pulled over at the first motel I saw, parked the car, rented a room, and took a long hot shower to wash away the nervous sweat off of me, which had soaked into the clothes that I had been wearing. I wish I was just joking with that, by the way. It was actually disgusting. So, after my shower, I'm still a little wired, so I unpack a few things like my phone charger, a pack of aspirin, stuff like that. And as I'm rummaging through one of the little side pouches in my suitcase, I feel something unfamiliar. At first I thought it might have been one of my ex's sobriety chips, an effort he'd abandoned long before my attempt to escape, but when I pulled it out and recognized what it was, I almost dropped it from how afraid I was. It was an AirTag, one of those little gadgets that helps you find lost keys or a lost wallet. My ex had slipped it into my luggage. I threw all my stuff into my suitcase, put on some clothes while my hair was still wet, and then ran out to the rental after leaving the air tag on the nightstand. I made it a matter of minutes, and I know that because a very, very short time after getting back on the road, my ex started blowing up my phone with calls and messages. They're not anything I'd care to repeat, but you can bet that they were some of the vilest things I'd ever heard said or seen written to anyone, let alone myself. They were wild, frantic, but a single thread ran through them all. When he found me, he was going to kill me, and he was certain of it too. He knew where I was, and he was coming to get me. There was just one problem. I wasn't at that motel anymore, was I? You see, one of the more insidious ways my ex exerted control was somehow convincing me that I needed to renew my license. If I needed to go anywhere, he'd give me a ride, or I could get an Uber on the rare occasion I went outside without him. For a long time, that was my setup. I had no freedom, no self-respect, and no idea how I was going to get myself out of the deep, deep hole that I got myself into. My ex assumed that I must have gotten a ride or an Uber to the motel, but he didn't stop to consider that I'd already implemented a keystone of my escape plan. When it came to renewing my license, my ex thought that there was no way I could without him knowing, since all the paperwork and the license itself would be delivered to the apartment. But since I was pretty much forced to work part-time so we could keep up with expenses, thank God for rising gas prices and food prices, I guess, I could get all the documentation forwarded to my place of work. The part-time wages also meant that I could actually pay for the fees myself, too, meaning that I wouldn't alert my ex by asking him for cash. The rule was, I could ask for money whenever I wanted, but how much I got depended entirely on how much my ex thought I needed. When all the prices went up, me having my own money was like a necessary evil to him. He didn't like it, but he couldn't afford to pay for all my stuff anymore, so it had to be done. And before any of you go making out that I was ungrateful, 
I can assure you that his fake generosity was nothing more than another attempt at exerting control. But then, with the money to afford the fees, as well as other things I'd need along the way, motel money being one of them, I was good to go, so off I went to rent a car. In my ex's head, there was nothing I could do but hope an Uber showed up before he did, or run off into the surrounding countryside which was a very bad option considering this is the middle of January. He thought he had me cornered, and he was so gleeful at the thought that you could read it in his text. I wasn't opening them as I was driving at the time, but almost every other message started with lol or lamau or ha 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 ha. I'm actually glad I was occupied at the time because it would have been real hard to resist the temptation to text him something like, I'm not there, you effing psycho, but your air tag is. I know it was much better to just say nothing, have him arrive at the motel, then realize his sneaky stalker idea hadn't been nearly as sneaky as he thought. I've been doing much better in the time since I escaped that beyond toxic relationship, but in all this time, I've also never experienced anything as singularly terrifying as pulling out an air tag and realizing that I was being tracked by a man who wanted my blood. And honestly, I hope I never feel that kind of terror, ever, again. I've flown three times in my adult life, and only because they were European or Asian vacations that included what I considered bucket list level locations. And the only reason I was able to manage those flights was because I was hopped up to the gills on Xanax. I also went to college several states away from home, exactly seven actually, which meant that when it came to traveling home for the holidays, the journeys sometimes turned into Tolkien-esque affairs. I'd set off for Vermont in the early morning and then do 10 hours of solid driving, which usually had me somewhere in rural Virginia. Then, depending on how tired I was, I'd pick the least crummy-looking motel I could find, preferably somewhere with a Hardee's nearby, and then rest up there for the night before getting back on the road in the morning. So, I'm driving home for summer at the end of the sophomore year at UVM and by that time, I had a preferred motel in Hardy's spot that I'd stopped at twice before. I don't want to give away the name of the place, but I guess knowing it's close to Hardy's, someone, somewhere will figure it out eventually. Anyway, I get to the motel, pay for my room, and then head out to the Hardy's to get a late dinner of biscuits and French toast dip. After that, I headed back to the room, took a shower, and then watched a little TV. I made it till 11.30pm before I finally snapped, and when I did, I got up from the bed, went over to my bags, and rummaged around a side pocket until I pulled out a crumpled pack of cigarettes. During that second year of college, I'm embarrassed to say that I picked up smoking from one of my roommates. It's a disgusting habit, and looking back on it, I can't believe how stupid I was to get myself hooked. Then, since my mom and dad would have lost their minds if they ever found out, I decided to wean myself before the drive home so there'd be no temptation to smoke all summer. Well, turns out I wasn't all that good at the weaning process, and by the time I checked myself into the motel, I was still getting these nightmarish cravings for nicotine right around bedtime. I tried resisting the urge, but since I had a long drive up ahead of me in the morning, I decided there was no time for a sweaty, sleepless night. So, I grabbed the crumpled up pack of smokes, fished out my lighter and then headed out onto the walkway to catch a late night buzz, and I remember thinking to myself as the sweet nicotine washed through my bloodstream, I am severely going to regret not quitting sooner, aren't I? In hindsight, the thought seems almost prophetic. The motel had this classic square bracket shape like a U with right angles instead of curves. My room was on one of the wings, overlooking the parking lot at a rectangle, and as I'm leaning on the railing, puffing away, I see a car roll into the lot. Some older looking guy gets out of what I think was a light colored Toyota Camry, then starts rummaging in his pocket for his motel room key. Then right as he gets to his room on the ground floor, I see a flash of movement in the darkness of my peripheral vision. And in a flash, these two people, a man and a woman, rush up to the older guy opening up his door and after what appeared to be a brief and subdued confrontation, the trio disappear into the motel room. 
I'm not saying I'm in possession of a sort of Jack Reacher level of a situational intuition, but something about the interaction struck me as extremely off. On one hand, the younger couple could have been waiting for him, maybe for hours, and were pissed when the pops or uncle or whoever it was finally showed up to let them into the motel room. But then, on the other hand, there was something highly suspicious about the way the younger couple seemed to rush the older guy, how he jumped in fright when he first turned to look at them, and how they gently pushed him into the room first, took a look around, and then closed the door behind them. I'd come to the last few drags of my cigarette anyway, so I stubbed it, walked back into the room to flush it down the toilet, and then grabbed my phone and walked back out onto the walkway. I didn't think my first call should be to the cops right away. I mean, I didn't 100% know what I'd seen. I'd feel like a total jerk if the cops showed up and they kicked in the motel room door and it turned out that the female half of the younger couple just needed to pee really bad and that's why they rushed over to the motel room. But still, I was ready to call 911 if I saw anything else, so I stayed put on the walkway and just kept watching the motel room that I'd seen the three people walk into. Then a second or two later, an idea popped into my head. I could walk down to the check-in area, roughly explain the situation, then ask very nicely how many people were booked into that room. But then, even if they did say just one person, I'm pretty sure the motel wasn't operating a no-guest policy, and at that point, I once again got the creeping sensation that I was totally exaggerating what I'd seen, as well as sticking my nose where it didn't belong. And with that in mind, I decided to ditch the whole asking the check-in area idea, and then just go back to my room and try to get some sleep. Then literally the moment I turned my back, I heard two loud but muffled bangs, obviously coming from one of the rooms across the parking lot. I grew up around guns and I instantly knew what I'd heard, so my immediate reaction was to sort of scuffle behind one of the concrete pillars that supported the upper walkway and call 911 to let them know that there had been some shots fired. But then just as I got behind that pillar and poked my head out so I could still see the parking lot, I didn't get a chance to dial 911 before the door of the room of the three people had just burst open. The person that ran out first was the male half of the younger couple, and he looked like he was limping a little, but he still made it all the way across the parking lot before the female half emerged. She fell on her face on the way out of the same door her man had just bolted out from, but picked herself up and ran a little more before the older guy, the one I'd spotted first, walked out of the motel room and shot her. I ducked down behind the pillar again, making myself as skinny as I could, then spent way too long unlocking my phone on account of how badly my hands were shaking in that moment. Then before I could actually send the call and put the phone to my ear, I heard two things in quick succession. The first was the voice of what I assumed to be the wounded woman. She shouted, please don't kill me, I'm pregnant. She tried to say something else, but was interrupted by the second thing I heard, and that second thing was the shot that killed her. It was probably the loudest sound I'd ever heard, not even because it was some large caliber pistol being fired 30 or 40 yards away, but because what was said before it. The older guy heard her say this, and he didn't even hesitate. Sure, I can see it being a lie, one designed to gain sympathy from someone that she'd believed to be as harmless as an old man, but to have him not even hesitate to shoot like that was truly horrifying. It wasn't even like he didn't even believe her either. He didn't stop to ask, really, or tell her that she didn't look pregnant. I know that some women can well be into their third trimester before they really start to show, but my point stands. It was like he did believe her but he just didn't care. I was still shaking from what had just happened when I realized that I hadn't even dialed 911 yet. The number was just hovering there on my screen. But I also didn't want the guy to hear me reporting him to the cops just in case he decided to come upstairs and get rid of any witnesses. So I hit dial, ran back in my room before slamming the door behind me, then slid under the bed just in time to catch the dispatcher saying for a second time, 911, what's your emergency? It's true what they say about time slowing down in those situations. I dealt with the 911 call, stayed on the line with the dispatcher, but watched the minutes literally crawl by while waiting for the cops to actually show up. 
I was worried some kind of shootout would break out, and I didn't see exactly how the guy ended up, but he must have just given himself up peacefully because I watched the cops walking him to the car, and he was completely silent and cooperative. I then made the mistake of looking over at the body of the woman he'd shot. He'd shot her right in the face. Right between the eyes, probably, because there was just this big hole where most of her face should have been and her head was lying at an angle, probably because there was no rear portion of skull left to support it. The thing is, it didn't look real. It looked like a movie prop, and I don't know whether that's because it really did look that way or it was just my brain's way of disassociating me from what I was actually looking at, but it was like I said, it just didn't look real. Not until the EMT showed up and put a white sheet over her. They don't do that with movie props. Not when there aren't any cameras around. It's been almost 15 years since I saw that woman get murdered. And I do mean murder too, because as much as I'm a believer in the Second Amendment, as well as a person's right to defend themselves, what happened was not self-defense. Maybe the first shot was, the one that scared off the male partner and the younger couple, but chasing that girl into the parking lot while she's running away, no longer a threat to him, that constitutes murder if you ask me. And then completely ignoring the girl's pleas, not even hesitating before executing her. I don't think I'll ever witness anything as cold-blooded as that again for as long as I live, which, if anything, would be one hell of a blessing. I graduated from UC Berkeley with a degree in social work in 2009. I'd had my heart set on working with vulnerable children and families ever since high school, and the origins of that are a whole other story I guess, so I'll try and stick to this one. I suppose you could say it all came down to me having something of a savior complex, and for a while I found it very rewarding. There's just one thing they don't tell you about social work, and that's how you come to hate some of the very same people you're charged with assisting. I'd say around 60 to 70% of the folks that I've dealt with during the year that I spent on the job were good, kind-hearted people who were simply down on their luck and usually through no fault of their own. But then there was the remaining 30%. About one in three cases, anyway, reminded me of that one line from Dante's Divine Comedy, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. The worst, by far, were the people who put on a happy family act during my visits, but were clearly neglecting or abusing their children behind closed doors. If I'd been working for Child Protective Services, those visits would have ended very differently, but I wasn't, so I had to bite my tongue, do my job, then hope my reports to CPS would be responded to before it was too late. By the end of year one, I was about ready to crack. I found it deeply ironic that social work bills itself as a sort of profession for people who care, when in reality, it's better suited to those with no emotions whatsoever. I confided in my boss, confessing my fears that I was developing an adversarial relationship with the people I was supposed to feel compassion for. I thought the admission would result in me filing an unemployment claim, but instead, my boss made a suggestion. Instead of being a social worker, maybe consider being a parole officer. He said he knew a guy who had been a PO for coming up on 20 years and that if he knew me as well as he thought he did, it would be right up my alley. I remember the exact thing he said that convinced me too. You can help the ones you actually want to, and those that you don't, you get paid to make their lives hell. 20 minutes later, I was on the CDCR's website searching for a vacant position, and that was 12 years ago. I've been a parole officer ever since, and it was the single best decision I had ever made. And my boss was exactly right. Not all parolees are like the ones you see in movies. In fact, at least 50% of the guys I've worked with over the years were similar to those I'd dealt with in social work. They were good people, some of which had made some very poor decisions in their lives, but they took responsibility for themselves and clearly wanted to make a change for the better. You try to maintain as professional a relationship as possible with your parolees for obvious reasons, but I think one or two of them, in some other life, we could have been friends. And one of them was a guy in his 60s I'll call Smokey. I don't want to give away Smokey's real name or any other personal details for that matter, but despite his severely checkered past, Smokey was actually a pretty good guy. 
I know that might bring my moral judgment into question when I tell you that Smokey was a convicted murderer with 35 years in prison under his belt. But it was true. All Smokey did was kill a man that would have inevitably killed him. He just did it preemptively rather than in self-defense. From what I understand, the man Smokey killed was a real scumbag, not what you might call a civilian at all. I'm not saying he deserved to die, but Smokey could have done a lot worse considering the kind of shenanigans he was up to before he went to prison. I'm not trying to make excuses for what he did. He took a man's life, and he deserved to be punished for it. But the man that left prison was not the same man that went in. During the last couple of assessments we did, all we did was drink root beers and shoot the breeze. Smokey was completely sober, didn't drink. He had a job as a truck mechanic and he was in the process of reconnecting with the grown-up daughter he'd long since drifted apart from. He was clean and serene, as they say, and the day was fast approaching when he'd be discharged from parole. So one day, Smokey and I were talking and he touched on one of the regular themes in our talks. He often talked about how many close calls he'd had during his criminal career and how lucky he'd been to walk away from each and every one. During previous conversations, I'd considered it redundant to ask about these close calls. There was very little chance an ex-con would share details of his criminal past with me, especially things he'd gotten away with. But on one of these final assessments, Smokey told me a story. Technically speaking, it didn't detail him doing anything illegal, or at least nothing I'd go running to my superiors over, not at that stage. But honestly, it was one of the scariest stories at least the scariest true story I think I've ever heard. Many years before, back before Smokey got his murder conviction, he worked for a narco-trafficking operation that operated up and down the West Coast. He was just muscle at first, I guess, but just like any other professional organization, his bosses started giving him more and more responsibility as he proved his competency. This might involve overseeing a shipment, meeting with a potential contact, or in this one case, tying up a loose end. At that stage of his career, Smokey had never shot or stabbed anyone, let alone taken a life. If he had a problem with someone, he used his hands, and he was big enough that just the threat of violence was enough to avoid potential conflict. But according to him, the job he was given wasn't as an enforcer. It was to be an executioner. Smokey gets called into the office of his boss, who operated out of some kind of front business, He gets asked if he knows a kid that we'll just call Babyface, and he does know this so-called Babyface because everyone knows him. Babyface was in his early 20s, but he looked like he could have passed for a high school freshman. Real youthful features, not a scrap of facial hair on him, all coming in at a pint-sized 5 foot 5, but full of this enthusiastic childish energy too. He'd been working for the traffickers for a couple of months at that time when, one day, He suddenly dropped off the face of the earth for 24 hours. Wouldn't pick up his phone, wasn't at any of the places he usually crashed, he was a ghost for like a whole day. And then, the traffickers' shipments started getting picked up as they passed across state lines in Oregon. To the boss, it was no coincidence. Babyface had been picked up by the cops and had obviously snitched. There was no other way of explaining it. At least, not in the boss's eyes anyway. And so Smokey was given a simple task. Meet up with Babyface at some motel in the middle of nowhere, walk him out into some farmer's field, and then shoot him in the face and cut the word rat into his body. Face, chest, it didn't matter. It just had to say rat. Like I said, Smokey had never clipped anyone before, so the idea of his first being this good-hearted idiot who'd made one little mistake, well, let's just say that wasn't ideal. On top of that, and this is according to Smokey, not me, but he felt like clipping this kid was playing right into the hands of the DEA, or the Drug Enforcement Agency. Smokey said it was a pretty common practice for them to snatch some of your shipments and then arrest one or two of your crew on bullcrap charges just before the seizure. The guys they picked up would stonewall the cops for 24 hours, giving them nothing, but then his bosses would think that he was a snitch. Best case scenario for the DEA... The snitch is then killed, and they can open up a murder investigation if their narcotics case is found wanting. This way, you can chip away at any organization's structure and morale, making them skittish and thus much more prone to mistakes. 
Smokey thought it could have been the same tactic being used on them, but he also knew that if he refused to clip Babyface, that it'd be him getting a bullet out back of the motel instead. So, he did the only thing he could do in this situation, told them that he'd get the job done, and then awaited further instruction. Then finally the day comes. Smokey gets a call first thing in the morning, telling him to drive out to a motel that was all the way out near Death Valley which, now that I think about it, is such a cartoonishly symbolic place to perform an execution that it's almost laughable. He gets told that the booking is under a certain name, which he uses to get the key to his room, and then he waits for the next three hours until Babyface finally shows up. The bosses had told him that they were impressed that he hadn't cracked under police pressure, and seeing as he'd proved himself to be a good soldier, they had some super-secret mission for him involving fake-name check-ins out in farmer country. Smokey played along, told him to get into his car, and explained how they were going to drive out in the middle of nowhere to pick up a package. Babyface hops in his car, totally none the wiser, and off they go. Smokey found a back road, drove all the way down it, and then marched Babyface off into the woods with a shovel. They were about a hundred yards in when Babyface realized what was really happening. Smokey had the good sense to be the one carrying the shovel, but as soon as Babyface started begging for his life, Smokey dropped the shovel, pulled out his gun, and pointed it at Babyface. He burst into tears, dropping to his knees, doesn't even try to run or fight, and he's wailing something like, I swear I didn't snitch. I swear to God, please don't kill me. I'll do anything. I'm begging you. My mom's sick. I don't know who will look after her if I'm gone. I know I messed up, but I swear I didn't snitch. You gotta believe me, and all this stuff. Smokey said it was the thing about his mom that got him the most, that the begging didn't do a thing. He told him that if he gave him his mom's address, he'd make sure that she got money for meds or a nurse, whatever it was she needed. But then instead of continuing to beg for his life, he watched his baby face's shoulders drooped like he was giving up and giving in. Babyface recited some address, zip code and all, and then unable to watch what was coming, he just slumped forward and accepted his fate. He didn't switch his story up like, oh no, I gotta get the med myself, you can't kill me. He seemed to legitimately believe that his potential executioner would get some money to his mom. He cared more for her life than he did about his own, and like I said, the thoughts started to eat away at Smokey's already wavering resolve. Smokey said that after a few seconds of feeling the pistol shaking in his palms, he lowered it and told the guy to stand up. He'd never seen anyone so scared before, and at first, this guy was so utterly consumed with terror that he could barely find his feet. Smokey told him to leave the west coast and go someplace far, far away. This was his second chance, and if he ever showed his face again, he would kill his mom, and then him, in that order. Bibbyface burst into tears again, only this time, tears of relief. He thanked Smokey over and over again just a mess of snot and apologies, then after one final barked command to disappear, he goes off into the woods, never to be seen again. Only just a few months later, somebody did see Babyface again. Not alive, but they did. And for Smokey, that proved to be a huge problem. One day, Smokey gets called in for a meeting with his boss. He has no idea what's it about and no reason to believe that he's in trouble or anything, so he goes along to see what his boss wants. He gets to his office and everything seems normal, but then when he walks inside, he detects this heavy tension in the air. His boss is sat there behind his desk with a very serious look on his face, not the usual, hey Smokey, how's the wife treating you? I mean, his boss is livid. It wasn't all that unusual to see him like that. But what really got the hairs on the back of Smokey's neck standing on end was the presence of two other men sat around the edges of the room behind where Smokey would be sitting in front of his boss. This was a huge warning sign for Smokey as, at one time, it had been him sitting around the edges of the room and the person in the hot seat had not been in an enviable position. And so, nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, Smokey sits down and faces the music. His boss opens by asking him to recount what happened on the day he clipped Babyface. Smokey goes over his story, which was all true, except for one little detail. When he's done, 
His boss stays quiet for a few seconds, looks over Smokey's shoulders at the guy behind him, and then asks him to tell them again. Smokey's heart is racing like a horse by this point, but he does as he's told and tells the story all over again, this time with as much detail as possible, especially when it came to the part that wasn't true, i.e. killing Babyface. When he's done, there's another moment of silence before his boss asks, Did you strip him? Of course, Smokey hadn't even killed the guy, let alone stripped him, so he says no. The boss then kind of holds his face in his hands like that's not the answer he wanted to hear. Smokey then seizes the initiative and starts asking if he was supposed to, saying he would have stripped the guy if he'd only been told to. His boss starts nodding in this understanding way, telling him to calm down but explains that they have a little situation on their hands. They had very reliable information that Babyface wasn't some half a meth head idiot who'd snitched rather than face another spell in prison. He'd been an undercover cop. Smokey didn't have a fake reaction when he'd heard that. It was all genuine, and his boss lapped it up. Smokey actually said that in that moment he actually wished that he had shot Babyface. He thought that he was doing a good thing in telling him to get lost, but it was looking more and more like it was the biggest mistake of his entire life. Smokey had messed up, big time, but he wasn't expendable, not in the same way that Babyface had been, or at least the person they believed that he was. So instead of getting whacked, Smokey was given a chance to make things right. His boss was scared that when Smokey shot the guy, he buried him while wearing some kind of tracking device, and when the cops realized that Babyface was dead and not just deep cover and unreachable, they'd be able to find him in a matter of hours. So it was up to Smokey, along with the two others in the room, to drive out to where he'd buried the undercover cop, dig him up, and then move him someplace else after removing any bugs or wires that he had attached to him. Easy, right? Well, as we both know by now, Smokey wasn't headed up there to dig up the undercover. He was going to be headed up there to dig his own grave. But then, what else could he do? If he tried to give them the runaround, his story would fall apart, and if that happened, there wasn't a hope in hell of him getting out of there alive. But if he just bought himself some time and drove those two guys out into farmer's country, there was maybe a chance of him slipping away through the trees while their backs were turned. After all, if they wanted to be in and out in a timely manner, they'd need more than one shovel in the ground to get the job done. Maybe Smokey goes off to pee and doesn't come back, or if worse comes to worse, maybe he can use a shovel to get the better of them before they get the better of him. So off they go, up into farmer country, out to the spot where Smokey killed, or rather didn't kill, the undercover cop. He walks them all the way out to roughly the same spot because he can't remember the exact route they took, and then starts digging with one of the guys helping and the other guy keeping watch. They dig for like an hour, get at least six feet deep, and there's nothing there. Smokey apologizes, and the two guys are pissed that they wasted a whole hour, but they buy a story that they dug in the wrong spot, and they move someplace else to dig another hole. But before they do, one of the enforcers chaperoning Smokey tells him to think really, really hard before they start digging again. The guy is pretty aggressive is obviously furious at Smokey for putting their lives and freedom at risk and might even have been told to whack him if they can't find the body, with Smokey being just another loose end they needed tying up. Smokey starts digging, with one of the two guys helping out again, then another hour into the digging, the helper throws his shovel down, climbs out of the hole, and decides to take a break. Smokey keeps reassuring them that he buried the guy too deep for dogs to smell the body, that he's a pro, that there's only a little more digging to do. The hole is now too deep for him to jump out and ambush them. He's trapped in a hole that'll most likely end up being his grave, and not the grave of that undercover cop. Right then, he thinks of another excuse and starts saying that it was dark when he finally found the place to bury Babyface, how he can't tell where he was, all this other stuff. But the two guys up top weren't interested. What they were interested in was someone or something that seemed to be approaching through the trees, and seconds later, Smokey hears someone shouting loud and clear, Sheriff's Department, show me your hands. The guy up top doesn't put his hands up. Instead, he turns to Smokey, 
pure, white-hot rage in his eyes and points the gun at him. He got off three shots and shouting out something before the deputies shot him dead in turn. One of those bullets made it into Smokey's leg, leaving a scar that I later saw with my own two eyes. As far as the cops were concerned, Smokey was the victim in this situation. He didn't say a word to them about what happened, so they figured that he was in some criminal conspiracy in some way, but since they also didn't have crap to charge him with, he got out of the hospital a free man. Or at least free in the legal sense, he still had his co-workers to deal with. They have already made up their minds that Smokey was some kind of rat, and to be fair, that's exactly what it looked like. They drove out in the middle of nowhere. One guy gets killed, another guy gets pinched, and then the last guy gets released without charges. It was highly suspicious. So instead of trying to plead his case with the bosses, who would never in a million years believe that he wasn't working with the cops, Smokey went on the run. A few weeks later, he's at another motel, someplace far from Northern California, when he notices someone watching him from the parking lot, someone he recognized. He did a little drive around town just to make sure that he was being followed, and then he drove down an alley, got out of his car with the engine still running, and hid behind a dumpster. The guy following him blocks him in, then walks up to Smokey's idling car. Smokey jumps out, sees the gun in his would-be assassin's hand, but it's too late for the guy to react. Smokey put all six bullets of a 38 revolver in him, ran off without picking up the casings, and then still had the murder weapon on him when he was pulled over by a motorcycle cop a few days later. And that's how he ended up with his 30 plus years in prison, and also in the company of myself. Smokey said that he'll never know for certain how the cops knew where to find him, but he had his suspicions. He knows for certain that he himself wasn't wearing a wire or a tracker and, in all probability, the guy who tried to kill him wasn't wearing anything either. But the third guy, who seemed to jump out of the hole for his break a little too close to the time the cops showed up, and who ended up in cuffs and not with a bullet in him, that was a little too suspicious to not be considered an option. Then again, there's a chance that in choosing to spare Babyface's life, Smokey won him some powerful friends. Friends who decided to help him out, just like Smokey chose to help Babyface out that day. Smokey was probably the most interesting man I've ever met in my life. Not a law-abiding one, not a successful one, but a good one and an interesting one. And Smokey lives and dies in anonymity. Although sometimes I think that he might just prefer it that way. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial. And maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, get up. Get down with the cheeseness.